A court has sentenced two journalists from the Reuters news agency to seven years. Scale, brutality, and systematic nature of rape and violence. The Burmese government is trying to keep what its soldiers are doing to an unwanted Muslim minority a secret. Hello, I'm Barbara Serra, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. The sentencing of two Reuters journalists in Myanmar and the failed promise of media reform there. There's a voice from inside the House, the White House, and it's speaking through the pages of the New York Times. The magic and mystery of the British royal family and the role of the media in spinning the fairy tale. Plus, Putin the Renaissance man, or at least that's how Russian state TV sees him. Police in Myanmar admitted there had been a setup. The Burmese military said the massacre that was reported did indeed happen. And yet, after eight months in prison, two Reuters journalists, Hua Lon and Cha So U, have been sentenced by a Burmese judge to seven years in jail. Their crime? obtaining secret state documents as they researched the killing and mass burial of 10 Rohingya men in 2017. The story of the ethnic violence against minority Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar has been in the headlines for over a year now. International media have had access into the country severely restricted, and much of the local media have taken the government and military side over the treatment of the Rohingya. Amid stories of military-orchestrated violence, recently confirmed in a United Nations report, the trial and sentencing of the Reuters reporters captured attention inside and outside Myanmar. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the case of Hua Lon and Cha So U and the very high price journalists in Myanmar pay if they report unfavorably on the military. <laughs> Outside a courtroom in Yangon, Myanmar, on the morning of the 3rd of September, journalists awaited news on the sentencing of two Burmese reporters, Walon and Cho So U. The verdict came down, seven years imprisonment, and just as they had done so many times in the eight months before this, the two men came out, declared their innocence, and were hauled into a police van to be driven away to jail. Reuters' Asia editor, Kevin Krolicki, was inside the courtroom when the judge issued the sentence against his colleagues. We had been prepared, intellectually prepared. We knew it was possible uh, that the judge would rule as he did. But nothing can prepare you for confronting injustice as it happens. Very hard, heartbreaking for the families of Wallon and Chosu. They both have young families. We've been following this case from the beginning. We already knew that there will be harsh standards. It is actually, but that it, I mean, it is, it is not very good, particularly in this moment. But I think it is not surprised to us because we've been through this harsh situation for long. Wallon and Chosu were arrested in December last year. A Burmese policeman admitted in court that the men had been entrapped. They had been researching a story about the mass killing and burial of 10 Rohingya men in Myanmar's northern Rakhine state. The police offered them key secret state documents that would corroborate their findings. The documents were in fact not secret. The situation was a setup, and the reporters were arrested and charged under the Official Secrets Act a law that has been on the books since 1923, when Myanmar was called Burma and was a colony of Great Britain. These two Reuters journalists were one of the few journalists in Burma that were actually doing investigative work into the situation in Rakhine State. They were sentenced under a colonial era law, the Official Secrets Act, but other repressive laws are extensively used as well. Uh, the Unlawful Associations Act, uh, the Peaceful Assembly Act, the Penal Code. There's a whole raft of repressive laws. These two journalists risk their freedom and their, their life to expose a genocide. They expose the highest crimes, the worst crime committed by the Burmese military. And this is the biggest threat for the, for the military. So they will never tolerate this. Myanmar's government has a unique structure unlike any government anywhere else. In 2016, Aung San Suu Kyi, the political activist who had been kept under house arrest for 15 years during the military dictatorship, 
took up the post of state councillor, akin to a prime ministership. It was a momentous event. An historic day for the Burmese people. Around the world, Myanmar's transition from a military to civilian government was heralded as the start of an era of democracy for the country. The reality was never quite so simple. 25% of parliamentary seats are reserved for the Burmese military. And, as mandated by the constitution, three key ministries, home affairs, defense, and border affairs, are headed by serving members of the military. For Aung San Suu Kyi and her NLD party, being in government has effectively meant working alongside, and often in subservience to, her former captors. Obviously, Aung San Suu Kyi and her government are limited in their powers because the military are still very much in control. The military control the police and much of the judiciary. So Aung San Suu Kyi's government cannot stop the police arresting journalists or other human rights activists. However, they do have the power to stop prosecutions going forward and also under presidential amnesties they can release political prisoners. But more importantly, they have the power to repeal these repressive laws that are being used. Uh, but we've seen none of those actions by, by the government. In terms of uh, NLD, in 2050, there is an election manifesto. There is particular promise about media. None of them yet fulfilled. Uh, we are very disappointed about it. So media freedom is not priority in this country. Reporting in local Burmese outlets on the violence against the Rohingya people has been poor. It isn't just intimidation, censorship or lack of access that has affected the coverage. Many Burmese have grown up hearing political and social rhetoric against the Rohingya, calling them vermin, illegals and a threat to the Buddhist majority. A lot of this language has been reproduced in the country's media over the years. And yet, when it has come to the case of Walon and Cho so Wu, journalists in Myanmar have largely shown solidarity. This case has set a worrying precedent, and they can see the danger that faces them all. If you look at this media in Burma, <clears throat> majority of them, the tool of the propaganda machine of the military, and they have uh, spread so many hatreds and misinformation about the Rohingya minority. But these two journalists, when they were arrested, media speak out. But they are not saying these two journalists exposed the crime of the military. But actually, these media are focusing on, on the press freedom. Whether media in Myanmar choose to report on it or not, the role of the country's military in the killings and forcing out of Rohingya Muslims has been documented in international reporting. The UN team said estimates that the military's scorched earth tactics have led to 10,000 deaths are conservative. And most damningly, in a recent report published by the United Nations Human Rights Council. The report states that the Burmese commander-in-chief, Min Aung Hlaing, and his deputies bear, quote, greatest responsibility for the ethnic cleansing of Rohingya people. The government declined our request for a statement on Walon and Cho so Wu's case. In a press conference, however, a spokesperson said the sentencing of the journalists was the clearest indication of an independent and a functioning judiciary. There had been hopes that Aung San Suu Kyi would use one of the few powers she does hold to grant a pardon to the reporters. That didn't happen, and in a media landscape already intimidated and controlled by the state, there's now a chill more intense than it has been in the past few years. Whatever happens now, nothing can make up for the eight months that Walon and Cho Su have been separated from their families, deprived of their freedom, and unable to work as journalists. But it is important now that, that the injustice of this conviction, that the prison sentence be overturned. It does send a very chilling uh, message to uh, the media in Burma, whether they are released under amnesty later or not. A very strong message given about reporting on issues uh, connected to the military, issues relating to Rohingya and uh, the situation in Rakhine State. Unfortunately, the verdict, if anything, provides support to those in the security forces who sought to cover up evidence of a real crime. Those who participated in that mass killing were sentenced to 10-year prison terms. The two men who exposed the killing were sentenced to seven years. That's an injustice by any standard, and it can't be allowed to stand.
We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar today with one of our producers, Tariq Nafa. Tariq, there's been a lot of concern over a new social media law that's been approved by the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Why the concern? Barbara, this new law gives Egypt's Supreme Council for Media Regulation the power to monitor any social media account, website or blog with more than 5,000 followers, which effectively means a personal Twitter page can be regulated in the same way as a media outlet. The law states that pages or websites that publish fake news or inciting material will be suspended or blocked. And of course, that's a clause that can be interpreted very widely indeed. Amnesty International says it gives the state near total control over print, online and broadcast media. And I spoke with Egyptian journalist Amr Khalifa about the law. This new media law is nothing short of socio-political asphyxiation for Egyptian citizens. It seeks to not only limit and suppress any journalistic uh, avenues of expression, but it does so for citizen journalists more so than anything else. You may not even think of yourself as a citizen journalist, but you will be equally arrested if the government deems what you say to be inaccurate, fake news, or the worst case of all scenarios, a threat to national security. So, Tariq, this law specifically targets so-called fake news uh, online, and that's a big issue for the Egyptian government, isn't it? That's right. President Sisi has blamed fake news for spreading chaos and instability in Egypt. In July, he said that rumours, acts of terrorism, loss of hope and feelings of frustration, all these work in a grand network aimed at one objective, only one objective, and that is to move people to destroy their country. Of course, accusing journalists and activists of spreading false rumours in Egypt is not new. But it is ironic because it's the government that is often accused by critics of spreading fake news and dis disinformation. Amr Khalifa told me that coupled with other laws in Egypt, it has the effect of shutting down any discourse that isn't government approved. Most every media law, whether it be the uh, recent, recent media law just confirmed or the cyber crimes law which preceded it or the terrorism law which preceded it by several years seek to do one thing and that is maximize and amplify government line and doctrine via a variety of media whether it be television radio newspapers digital or otherwise while at the very same time suffocating discourse uh, that is alternate and as Amal Khalifa said, this new media law is just the latest measure in what has been months of tightening restrictions on media in Egypt. And of course, numerous journalists, activists and academics continue to be arrested and jailed. One of Al Jazeera's journalists, Mahmoud Hussein, has been imprisoned in Egypt for more than 620 days now without trial. That's right, without trial and without charge, and the network does continue to call for his release. Let's take a look at another story now. The New York Times took what it called a rare step in the past week by publishing a pretty explosive anonymous opinion op-ed uh, piece. There it is. Tell us why it's so explosive. Well, Barbara, it's highly unusual for a newspaper to publish an anonymous op-ed. And in this case, the piece was written by a senior White House official who says there are members of the administration working to, quote, frustrate part of, parts of Trump's agenda and his worst inclinations. And the Times attached a note to the op-ed saying that the writer's identity had to be protected and that publishing the piece anonymously was the only way to deliver an important perspective to their readers. The entire process was reportedly conducted so secretively that even the Times' news department had no idea that the piece was about to be published. And President Trump and his supporters have long said that there are two forces in America working to undermine his presidency. One is the news media, the other is the so-called deep state. So you can imagine their reaction to this article. Trump questioned on Twitter whether the gutless White House official even exists, and if so, said that the failing New York Times should turn them over to the government. Tariq, thank you.
The royal wedding that took place in London four months ago played like a scene from a fairy tale, and the media lapped it up. Events like these play a part in the British royal family's ongoing effort to rebrand itself. Like Prince William's wedding to Kate Middleton back in 2011, the televised nuptials of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have helped Buckingham Palace repair its public image, which was badly damaged following the death of Princess Diana in 1997. But what about the role played by the intermediaries, journalists in this royal rebrand? Well, the pomp and pageantry might mean little more than ratings and clicks for international media, but Britain's fourth estate is supposed to hold the country's elite to account. And they don't come much more elite or privileged than the House of Windsor, funded by the taxpayer. But is the royal reporting British audiences usually get long on deference and short on scrutiny? The Listening Post's Daniel Tory now on the relationship between media and monarchy in the United Kingdom. On the 19th of May, the British royal family delivered the kind of global media spectacle that only it seems capable of. One that featured in news cycles across continents. It is so exciting to be here in Windsor. It is a charming town, 20 miles outside of London, and it's really steeped in royal history. With viewing figures in the hundreds of millions, it's little wonder the world's media were out in force. As a journalist covering it, um, you felt that you were covering an iconic moment in royal history. Well, that, that is some dress, Adrian. I'm still sort of just absorbing that. Some action. of those prime positions that were taken by the BBC, ABC. We do have a prime viewing spot. Some of the other American networks were costing in the region of six figures every day. That tells you that the networks clearly thought they were going to get a return for their money. This is bigger than any reality TV show you're going to tune into. And this is real life. Even at The Guardian, who are an, uh, you know, an officially Republican paper, they can't help but cover it because they instantly worry that there will be the only newspaper without any coverage. There was a huge amount of media attention on it. And at the same time, you don't get the hard-hitting journalism. You don't get people querying exactly how much the wedding costs and why we're still funding it. Oh, I think the problem is lots of people don't like to talk about the numbers. If questioning the cost of royal events can feel a touch awkward for British journalists, that's not the case for their audiences. According to a UK opinion poll taken days before the wedding, the majority of Britons opposed any public money being spent on it. The royal family says it paid for the private aspects of the ceremony, but they won't specify whether that money came from their private wealth, estimated at more than a billion dollars, or from the annual sovereign grant they received from the government, $105 million this year. However, we do know that the bill for security, reportedly as much as $40 million, was picked up by taxpayers. Britain's media, covering an era of austerity, are usually quick to query public spending. But when it involves royalty, they can seem curiously coy. Should more questions have been asked about costs of security? Maybe. But there is a tendency to avoid what we call sour grapes. Once it became clear that Parliament did not vote in an extra five million pounds to pay for the wedding, I think the broadcasters accepted that. The funding and wealth um, of the royal family is something that needs much more attention. So what we've seen in Britain in recent years is a very stark contrast of inequality. So we've seen a huge rise in the number of people who are using food banks, public services, education, have seen massive cuts. No no what we've seen in the same period is um, royal finances increasing. Buckingham Palace um, be awarded, I think it was over 300 million for renovations. So it's about making those connections to the austerity politics that are going on in, in Britain. Over the centuries, the British monarchy has lost many of its formal powers, but the sovereign and the heir to the throne do still inherit certain unique privileges. Tax on the profits from their estates is voluntary and doesn't have to be disclosed. Then there are the Queen's weekly confidential meetings with the Prime Minister, which allow her to air her views on government policy. The Queen and Prince Charles also receive all memoranda from the Cabinet and have the right to veto new laws that affect them. And as a Guardian Freedom of Information request revealed, 
Prince Charles lobbies ministers in private meetings and letters. Are you still writing to ministers letters like that? Have yes. oh, you been behaving unconstitutionally by let writing letters like that? However, during the Guardian's investigation, the government passed a law granting the Queen and Prince Charles an absolute exemption from the Freedom of Information Act, making it even harder for journalists to scrutinise the monarchy. Instead, Britain's royal correspondents tend to cover the fluffier side of royalty. I think probably we can get a little preoccupied with the flippant. For example, if you're on a royal engagement, you know, your, your job is to relay what's going on. It may well be a visit to the Teenage Cancer Trust or um, an AIDS-related charity for Prince Harry's work. And, um, you know, you're often finding that your top line in the story is, wow, Meghan stepped out and bespoke Givenchy again. There is an issue here about taking members of the royal family, holding them directly to account, as you might with a politician, or a business person, or whatever. Should I be shouting a question? Of course. As a journalist, the answer is, yes, I should. Tradition, protocol, our DNA with the royal family determines that, by and large, we don't. We're a timid, feeble lot. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. We ought to be bolder. If the commercial value of royal news explains how it gets reported by Britain's privately owned outlets, that still leaves the public broadcaster the British Broadcasting Corporation. The BBC's constitution, the Royal Charter, says its primary mission is to provide impartial news. But when it comes to royalty, critics say the BBC's coverage falls seriously short. The BBC constantly talk about balance when it comes to everything else, about politics, economics, climate change, etc. But when it comes to the royal family, simply isn't there. The thoughtful leader, the sensible girl and the mischievous redhead doing things with that unaffected style which has become their hallmark. It feels as if in many ways the BBC is simply doing PR for the royals. Every single time there's a royal birth, they will be outside the hospital waiting, just filling time as there's nothing to really go on. This news coming into us that uh, there could be an announcement soon. And every single press trip or any form of public outing is covered without any form of criticism by the BBC. This is Batman's motorbike which was altogether too much for William, a keen biker himself, to resist. The BBC seem to have completely accepted that the state broadcaster should be deferential. We put this criticism to the BBC. The press office replied that the BBC applies due impartiality to all of our output, including our coverage of the UK monarchy. There's a saying about the British press that they're either at your throat or at your feet. And in the 1980s and 90s, the relationship between media and monarchy was more hostile. Headlines like these were common, as Britain's tabloids ruthlessly exploited royal private lives. But the death of Princess Diana in 1997 marked a turning point. Newspaper owners, accused of hounding Diana to her death, promised to keep a more respectful distance. As for the royal household, its response to the crisis was seen as cold-hearted. And faced with a dramatic drop in popularity, Buckingham Palace began its rebrand, with a little help from the professionals. What we can see in the royal household um, is a set of individuals, particularly in the Royal Communications Office, who have previously worked um, in various media corporations, who have a particular, a particular knowledge about how to package um, royal news in particular ways that will work for the news cycle. To remake the British monarchy as uh, more modern, as more cosmopolitan, as more multicultural and using the tools that those younger royals offer them. I think the younger generation really understand that if they show themselves to be a bit more down to earth, whether that's by working in the army for a bit or by going to Wimbledon. If they play the game, then the media will play along with them. The success of the monarchy's modernization is undeniable. It's those covering them who seem stuck in the past. In 1867, Walter Badgett, editor of The Economist, wrote, above all things, our royalty is to be reverenced. And if you begin to poke about it, you cannot reverence it we must not let in daylight upon magic. Poking about is the job of journalism. But for some British journalists, the magic of royalty clearly still casts a powerful spell. I think we got a little wave there. There is no question we got a wave.
And finally, Russia's state-owned Rossiya One TV channel launched a new show this past week called Moscow Kremlin Putin. In the first episode, an hour-long affair, the show's famously pro-Kremlin host, Vladimir Solyov, aired footage of President Putin trekking up a hillside, cruising on a boat and speaking with school kids. He even had the president's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, on set for an interview about Putin's love for children and the secrets to his, quote, beautiful physique. Rosia One hasn't explained the rationale for this show. It probably isn't a coincidence that it comes at a time of protests over the raising of age limits for pensioners. Recent polls in Russia have also shown Putin's numbers slipping and in need of a boost. We're leaving you with some clips from the premiere of Moscow Kremlin Putin, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Добрый вечер. Сегодня в программе. Кадры, которые еще никто не видел. 8 километров по горам. Это зарядка. Для нас сами это зарядка. Что после такой зарядки с сопровождающими? Вот уже сколько дней прошло, а у меня до сих пор ноги болят. Эксклюзив программы. У президента уходит на поддержание такой физической формы. Ну, он сам неоднократно об этом рассказывал, но, насколько я понимаю, где-то часа полтора, потому что он, он меньше часа плавает практически ежедневно, когда есть возможность, когда нет затяжных командировок, он проплывает свой ежедневный километр. На секундочку, вот, обычному человеку километр каждый день. Это, Могу это... только пешком по дну. Это изрядная физическая нагрузка. Вот, и в зале занимается, и в хоккей играет.